Thank you. As I introduce, my name is Kyung Lun Lee. Well, it is my great pleasure and honor to stand before you as a speaker. So I really appreciate the opportunity. And you know, today is a holiday, but still we have a large audience. And I think the presence, your presence clearly shows the significance of the ICH guidelines. So I will share the summary of the M12, uh, where the final uh, version of the guideline was published this year. This guideline is about uh, uh, DDI. As a person who develops the drug, actually, uh, it is important to utilize the guideline so that we can actually uh, communicate well and persuade well the regulatory body including MFDS, FDA and EMA. And for the regulatory uh, perspective, well from the regulatory perspective, uh, where need to be uh, focused on uh, can be also understood by understanding the guideline. As I prepare for this presentation, I believe that the MFDS, uh, EMA, FDA, in 2020, the final version was published by FDA. So all these things are summarized in a way for this guideline. And therefore, the guideline is quite lengthy. And usually um, the, from the FDA, the, the different sections were published in a different uh, guidelines, but now it contains everything, including the uh, non-clinical and the clinical. So these are the contents. Introduction, in vitro evaluation, clinical evaluation, and other topics. And also how the reporting should be done and how to interpret DDI study result and the risk management and risk assessment. So these are included in this section and also appendix and references. And actually, of these topics, well, it is about technologies to predict the DDI, but I do not talk all of them because of the time constraint. Rather than I will focus on the structure of the guideline and how we interpret this guideline. So in vitro evaluation or a clinical evaluation, actually compared to the FDA uh, documents or the guidance in 2020, actually they have a separate uh, guidance on these topics, but they are included in here. The reason I have different color for this is because these sections are the major sections of this guideline. And appendix is also different color because when it comes to the DDI and the in vitro DDI uh, data or in vivo data, how we can make the prediction and how we can assess those, those data, uh, there are many tools for that purpose. And actually, the appendix has those uh, tools and information. And I will talk about that a little bit during my presentation. So this is the introduction. The, the introduction contains objectives, background, scope, and general principle. So let me uh, stand here so that I can uh, read my slide better. The biggest objective of the guideline is actually we need to understand why the guideline is developed. So when it comes to the objective, as you can see from here, whether it is an enzyme uh, or the transfer mediated in vitro and clinical DDI studies, how it can be designed, conducted and interpreted. That is the one the guideline provides. It says enzyme or transporter mediated. I highlight them in red, so please remember that. Well, from the PD perspective, the DDI can be thought about, but basically, you know, the ADME is important for the PK. So ADME can be uh, modified by the biological factors metabolism and transporter. So here, enzyme is about metabolism and transporter is the drug 
drug transporter. These two can cause the DDI. And in vitro and in vivo, how these two can be studied in the DDI study. And because this is the ICH guideline, of course, the regulatory agencies of different regions are harmonized in this guideline to meet the requirement of the multi-regulatory agencies. Because this is, is a DDI, uh, patients take multiple drugs. You can think about the senior citizens, they take about at least two to three pills a day. So when they are taking, when patients are taking multi-drugs, what kind of effect uh, that the patients can uh, experience and how the safety profile uh, they experience. So these are the objectives of this guideline because the regulatory bodies want to regulate and monitor the DDI and also sponsors uh, need to utilize this guideline so that they can go to the market. A background. So the, for the DDI, if the patient take more than one drug, then they can cause DDI. So they can cause multiple health issues or serious health issues. And also, when it comes to AE, there is an increased risk of AE because of DDI. And therefore, in developing new drugs, like the investigation of drugs, the new drugs, for those drugs need to be studied in terms of the interaction with other products, other drugs that need to be predicted and assessed. And because of that, the guideline is published. And as a sponsor, we need to study the guideline so that we can, how we can go about this point when it uh, interacts with the guide, uh, regulatory body. And um, because this is an ICH guideline, it provides the harmonized recommendation for in vitro and in vivo evaluation of DDI. So that's one part of the background too. As for scope, the scope provides the limit of the drugs where this guideline can be applied. So for uh, PK, interaction is the one that is covered by the guideline. And metabolic enzyme and transport-mediated interactions is the focus. And also, it's focused on the development of small chemical molecules. And of course, in the other topic section, there is a mentioning on biologics. However, that is not much. It's only about a one paragraph. So monoclonal antibody or antibody drug conjugate, ADC, which is quite popular recently, these things are mentioned. However, there are clearly limitations uh, for this guideline to be applied to the biologics and its DDI evaluation. And metabolite-mediated interactions, meaning the metabolite from the metabolism. So the metabolite itself actually cause interaction serving as a inducer or inhibitor. So that is also uh, addressed in the guideline. And these need to be predicted by uh, utilizing model. So the prediction is also included in the guideline. And for other modalities, the emerging ones, for them, this guideline does not cover them. Small molecule, uh, small uh, chemical molecules are basically the within the scope of this guideline. And other types of the PK interactions, for example, gastric pH change, then because of the PKA, the resolution rate of the drug would change, and therefore the PK would change. This is not included in here, but it will be covered by regional guidelines. So that's all about the scope. 
For general principles, I think this is the most important message from these general principles. From the FDA guidance, actually, the DDI uh, has two concepts, the ones that cause interaction. It says perpetrator. The FDA calls it as a perpetrator. And the substance that is affected, the FDA calls it as a victim drug. But here it says the affected drug is object, which was victim. And precipitant is the a substance that actually exert effect, which was called as a perpetrator in the FDA guidance. So the terminology has been changed. And elimination of drug is should be identified. And metabolic enzyme and transporter medi mediated DDI is important, is highlighted in here. And for the clinical mass balance study, once the drug is administered and the and the clear characterization uh, of the drug route need to be characterized. And that's a keystone. And actually, this is not just about the this guideline alone. When it comes to the PK characterization under PK principle means that all the route of the elimination for this drug has been all characterized or not. So the drug, how much exposure of the drug uh, to the body and how well and how fast it's observed. And also the clearance pathway here under the PK concept is very important. And then uh, this route is also affecting uh, the DDI. And that's the keystone of the identification here. And enzyme and transporters are important for the DDI. So what is here important, I mean, Abject, precipitant, enzyme, and transporters. I think these are the key words for this guideline. The clinical studies and non-clinical studies, there are things that need to be considered for this, but uh, because of the time constraint, I will just to mention briefly the keywords. So here, these text here are all the paragraph in the guideline. So with this material, you can actually refer to all the details in the guideline. So I uh, went over introduction and I said that there are two sections, most important one in vitro evaluation and in vivo, which is clinical. In vitro evaluation here, for in vivo means clinical study. These two terms are interchangeably used. When I say in vivo, it means clinical study. So for the in vitro evaluation, the FDA has a separate chapter on the in vivo evaluation and all that is included here. And of course, some part has been modified a little bit. See the overall, overall uh, the structure has been highlighted many times in in vitro evaluation. We have the metabolism mediated interaction, transporter mediated interaction, and also metabolite. So these three are falling into in vitro evaluation. So these are very important structure that you need to understand. So here in the subtitles for each slide, you can see the keywords highlighted. So these are the important keywords for each sep uh, section. For the in vivo study, um, that's the first step. So for the DDI object, I said the affected substance, which are substrate and the precipitant. 
So we have two here for the precipitant, the CYP inhibitor or inducer. And metabolism, this is the metabolism, and we are talking about the CYP. I will explain why later. So we have the CYP substrate, which is object, and inhibitor and inducers, they are precipitant. So our drug as a precipitant, they can work as an inhibitor or inducer. For the inhibitor parameter, how can we calculate that? And how can we measure that? So that uh, whether we have a we will have a DDI or not. That kind of a basic model is introduced in chapter two. And by using this model, the basic model, we can uh, expect or uh, predict the DDI. So if there is expected to have the DDI, then we do uh, in vivo DDI study. Or we can utilize more advanced model so we don't know for sure whether DDI will occur or not. The base, basic model is very conservative model, so it, does, it provides a simple calculation but may not be very much realistic. So because this is a conservative model, the DDI may not be predicted. So we can, you can submit the data from this modeling but at the same time, oh, this is too conservative. So actually, we need to be more practical and realistic so that we can utilize advanced model. That can be a static model and dynamic model. For the static model and the dynamic model, uh, we can utilize these models in order to make prediction for the DDI. That would be included in the section on the clinical uh, study. Chapter 7 actually provides a good a description. Of course, it talks about static model only, but the dynamic model is something that we make as a, a reasonable model, so the guideline cannot deal with it. So these are the things that we can do. So let's say we don't expect DDI then we don't have to do the clinical study. However, if there is a prediction or for the DDI, then we need to do the in vivo DDI study. And chapter three deals with the in vivo DDI study, the design and how we implement and how we all, all interpret the result of the in vivo DDI study. So this is the overall structure. So let me go into some details. We are talking about metabolizing enzyme, the substrate, which is object. So here, because of what enzyme, it becomes the enzyme, uh, metabolizing enzyme that need to be uh, studied in a very uh, early days. And identification and what CIP enzyme phenotyping and mass balance study in vitro study can be done. At the same time, the total elimination, meaning that from all the route of the drug elimination, if there is a 50 to more than 25% enzyme, then we need to assess it in the clinical study, meaning that. If there are more metabolite in body generated, then it means that there is a, a more uh, possibility, higher possibility of DDI occurring. So if you look at the guideline, there are major CIPs. You can see this. 1A2, 2B6, 2C8, 2C9, 2C19, and 2D6, and 3A. So for the major CYPs, we need to understand the route of the metabolism and also UGT 1A1, 1A3, 1A4, like that. So there are pathway, uh, the UGT pathway, these need to be assessed. And there are others. Other CYPs, maybe uh, those CYPs may serve as a major CYP, then we need to assess them. However, if you look at all different drugs, when it comes to the concentration, these are the concentration distribution. But as for the metabolite or the metabolism uh, route, usually they are all about 
to uh, to D or to C. So major, um, most of the drugs here are falling into this major CIPs. And for others, uh, you can go for like case by case. So I talked about the metabolism. For the regulators, the DDI is about the new drug affecting other drugs. That's really important because other drugs are already approved drugs and they are in the market. So the new drug, when the new drug is in the market, that new drug should not interact with other drugs, existing drugs. So, of course, at the same time, the new drug can be uh, affected by existing drugs. So the substrate is important, but at the same time, whether uh, my drug uh, serve as an inducer or uh, the inhibitor, that is important question to ask. So here it talks about the inhibitor, drug as an inhibitor. So here for metabolic enzymes, these are major CYP enzymes, and these uh, enzymes can be inhibited by my drug. It can be reversible inhibitor or time-dependent inhibitor. For reversible inhibitor, it does not relate it to time. However, for the time-dependent inhibitor, depending on the time, the level of the inhibition may change. But both cases, uh, the evaluation need to be conducted. So here, for the reversible inhibition, as you can see here, the assessment or the prediction can be made. The basing model that I mentioned is applied here. Based on the basing mo model, the inhibition, the level of the inhibition for enzyme is represented as Ki. So here, the, uh, the matrix, other matrix, whether they, those matrix will be used together or not, it depends on the situation. If the drug is pre free form, which means that it is bound to others, uh, like the albumin, it does not bound to others. So this is why it is called as a free form. So unbound inhibition. So here, the Concentration in blood, which is CMAX here, this is important in terms of the steady state. When we, when I work with other organizations, the single, uh, the CMAX of the single dose is usually mentioned. However, we do repeat those a lot of times. So steady state, when it, it arrives at the steady state, actually the CMAX is the highest and therefore we need to apply the highest CMAX and also unbound uh, fraction. So usually the CMAX in body, uh, albumin or other proteins are bounded together and therefore the total concentration need to be considered. However, here we need to focus on the free form, not the total. So, and then uh, it's multiplied by 50, then it should be uh, lower than Ki. So the level of the inhibition should be higher than the concentration. And here, 50 fold. Why 50 fold? We call it as a safety factor because it may be different for one to another, but 50 uh, fold is kind of a safety factor. This is the predicted value, not the uh, tested data. So when it is higher by 50 fold, there will be no effect. And that's why it is called as a safety factor. So by doing the calculation, if this value is lower than 0 0.02, then there will be no DDI. So that's a very simple model. So for the reversible inhibition, this is what we need to do, but I talked about unbound fraction. In Appendix 7, the protein binding assay is mentioned, and there what we uh, observe is, for example, 0 0.01 lower than that is quite not easy. The 
if it is coming from the old validated system, the value, the result would be fine. But if it's lower than 1%, then the total consideration here is multiplied by 0 0.02. C makes U, it's unbound. So that's what we can calculate. So unbound fraction will be mentioned many times, and you need to understand the unbound uh, that fraction with this uh, formula. For 3A4, uh, it can be in intestine. 3A4 is uh, much expressed in the intestine. Here, maximum clinical dose is applied. If you have the clinical data, then the highest dose from the clinical data uh, would apply. But if not, then the clinical maximum in a clinical dose in in vitro can be uh, predicted and applied. And when it comes to 250 ml, it is a kind of a one glass of water. So here, with the maximum clinical dose, uh, 0.1, and it means 10 here, this is the safety factor. Uh, here, the safety factor is set at 10. So lower than that means that there is no DDI in intestine. So these are also basic model application. If you refer to the section 7.5, there is a, a predictive modeling. And what I just explained is also included in there. So based on this concept, well, if the DDI is expected in a PPK model or a mechanical a statistical model can be applied. And if there is a DDI predicted, then the, you need to do the clinical study for that. Index substrate need to be used for that clinical study. Um, still, I am on the drug as a uh, inhibitor for of the CYP enzyme. Here, this is the time-dependent inhibition. The concept is the same. There are different formula. You can read it afterwards. This is time-dependent. So, enzyme itself, uh, there is a, a speed of that enzyme to be inactivated or uh, to be degraded. So these time need to be included. So here again, the exposure concentration in body is uh, multiplied by uh, 5, which is the safety factor here. So here, time-dependent inhibition, we can expect no DDI. But if it's higher than 1.25, and then uh, the next system need to be considered, which is the mechanistical model and the PK uh, model. If not, if that is not uh, sufficient, then going forward, the clinical study need to be also considered. Uh, so this is 1.25, as I said. You can think it as an AUC ratio. If the AUC ratio is a 1.25, it means that 25%, more than 25% increase. So it's an inhibition. So something blocks my uh, route. So it's inhibited to for the elimination. The exposure, therefore, will increase. And if it's uh, higher than 1.25, then there will be the DDI. So in the clinical study, the same concept will apply too. And now I'm moving to UGT. So the drug is an inhibitor of UGT, UGT 1A1, 1A4, 1A9, 2B7, and 2B15. So these need to be included in the study and recombinant UGT or human liver microsome need to be used in order to uh, assess and the selective substrate need to be used. A co-incubation uh, should be conducted in order to see how much changes are observed. For UGT, like the CYP, it's not like that. I mean, the UGP is not that much perfect. The data from the UGT, how we can scale up them, those data uh, quantitatively, it's not like that much well established. So the application of the UGT data may be limited. However, still, 
here you can see that uh, you can apply the same approach to the UGT as you do with the CYP. So you can utilize this kind of in data during the development. So it may not be that much clear or complete uh, like the data from the U uh, CYP, but still we need to understand and evaluate the inhibitor uh, for the UGT and the basis here uh, is the same with the uh, CYP. So I talked about the inhibition, so from now I will talk about the inducer. So here, drug as an inducer for the CYP enzymes. So CYP enzymes are induced and therefore the function of the enzymes can be uh, facilitated. So the uh, route uh, which was inhibited by CYP is now uh, actually expanded and therefore the uh, elimination uh, is pre uh, precipitated. So PXR, CAR, and HR, these are the receptors, and these receptors are activated. And with the activation, the enzymes or the transporters are expressed more. So that's what this guideline section contains. So three receptors that I just mentioned, you need to think about them quite well. When we do the study, hepatocyte, the human hepatocyte need to be used and at least three individual donor and the hepatocyte from at least the three individual donors need to be used because there are individual differences. And mRNA level, the mRNA, the targeted enzymes mRNA should be measured. And 3A4 to B6, when it to be should be uh, included. PXR and CR, the receptors that I mentioned, 3A4 or 2B6, uh, these are also related to that. Actually, the that relationship is quite strong. So 3A4, 2B6 uh, or 2C19 or 2C9, these are activated with the PXR, 2C8, 9, 19 for them, like a CYP4, they're not likely to be induced much and therefore you need to think about it. 3A4, if there is an induction, uh, indu uh, inducement of the uh, uh, CA4, then you need to think about other enzymes that is related to the inducer of this one because they are likely to be induced too. And another thing, 2C19, it's induction, and the mRNA response for that induction is many times limited, and therefore the function study need to be conducted. mRNA level and the protein level, they are related, but not always, so that should be considered. So when it is induced, how do we assess it? The mRNA fold change is studied. So the drug is administered and bound to the uh, receptor and then there is a mRNA fold change occur and that should be compared to the baseline. So based on that, we can determine uh, whether there is an induction uh, occurred or not. Basic method, as I said, mRNA fold changes utilized. There are many different things included in here. So correlation method can be also utilized if there is a limitation. mRNA fold change and of uh, correlation uh, method, I will mention it later on one more time. And basic model, of course, can be used, but at the same time, mechanistic model or BK model can also be used for the prediction so that you can have a wave, a wavier for the clinical uh, study. And if that's not the case, then finally, you have to do the clinical study in order to generate data. And we talked about mRNA fold change. 
And if I explain a little bit, actually it's all about how much changes, to what extent of the changes occur for the mRNA. So CNA, uh, CYP enzymes concentration dependent changes to the mRNA. That's what uh, this method or the model tries to understand. Depending on that, we can say that mRNA has been induced or not. So here, uh, 50. The CMEX, the CMEX, the unbound fraction is multiplied by safety factor of 50. If it is lower than that, and then there is a two fold, more than two fold mRNA concentration uh, increase. If that is the case, then we can say that there is a induction. Positive control sometimes is decreased lower than uh, by more than uh, six times than the mRNA expression. Uh, it cannot provide everything, but sort of the so when the responses of the positive control is lower than sixfold increase in mRNA, then induction potential cannot be just ruled out. And I talked about the correlation method. For the correlation method. The, it's also about assessing the induction. The RIS is the relative induction score. There are many different models for the induction, and it depends on the concentration, Emax and the Cmax, and if 50 are calculated. And if we have that, then we can utilize RIS. Then uh, we can calculate AUC ratio. The AUC ratio, if it's over uh, 0.8, then in vivo induction risk, test risk can be excluded. Which means if it's like a 20, more than 20% of the decrease, and then the drugs will be eliminated faster. And if the reduction is more than 20%, then we call it as an induction. And if the AUC ratio is over 0.8, it means there is no impact. So these concepts are actually interrelated. So the exposure, when there is a lower level of the exposure, then 0.8 is important. And if it's a higher, high uh, exposure, uh, that means 0.25. We have a basic kinetic model. The so similar um, testing can also conduct it. Our value is 0.8 here. If it's over 0.8, and um, it can exclude the risk for in vivo induction. So I will move a little bit faster from now. CIP enzyme, again, inducer. There are things to be dis uh, considered here again. So actually, UGT is an issue. PXR or the CR, they can be affected. Uh, it can affect the UGT. However, it's not easy to quantify. So the UGT data, it's not easy to utilize. So the, there should be some considerations made for that. So we talked about the in vitro and metabolism mediated DDI was covered. And second part of the in vitro evaluation is the transporter-mediated DDI. So I will talk about the transporter-mediated interaction. For the transporter, it has been studied about for 20 or 30 years, so we don't have a lot of data. So metabolic enzyme, like a CYP, Unlike it, we do not have a very complete and quantified data for transporter, but still, more recently, many drugs experienced DDI, uh, which was mediated by transporter. So substrate, transporter substrate should be determined through the clinical study or in vitro study evaluation can be done so during the preclinical trial uh, stage, we can determine whether a drug is a tra uh, transporter uh, substrate or not. So this is what is needed. Uh, 
So just in the case of the inhibitor, drug as a substrate of the transporter, you can see here, PGP or BCRP, these are the efflux transporters. They actually, if uh, they actually um, uh, raise or remove the drugs from the body as an efflux transporter. So efflux transporters, uh, many of them are expressed in the GI tract, liver, kidney, of course, and also brain are the areas where they are expressed. However, in the absorption, they affect a lot. So PGP or BCRP. Uh, need to be assessed whether the drug is a substrate or not. Uh, OATP 1B1 and 1B3, these are the hepatic uptake transporters. So in livers, the drugs in the uh, blood that actually transport them into the liver. So these transporters need to be considered too. The total drug the eliminated through the elimination if the 25 or more higher than 25 a percent of the hepatic clearance is observed then wt 1b1 or 1b3 uh, characterization should be considered and we also have the Ranar transporters, OAT1, an ion transporter, or the cation uh, uh, transporters, OAT3, OCT2, MATE1, and uh, MATE2K. So they usually expressed in kidney. And there is an excretion uh, organ, which is the kidney here. So here again, like in the uh, liver, in kidney, the active anorana secretion, if it is higher than 25% of the total, then the transporters here need to be considered. And additional transporters. For that, case-by-case uh, -case assessment is needed. Most of the transporters are usually falling in three of the transporters in this uh, slide. So there are many uh, ways to assess them or evaluate them. The transporter in the cell where the transporter is overexpressed and then the drug is administered and then compared to, compared to the control, we see the changes. So that's the basic method. The specific transporter and in the cell where the specific transporter is ex overexpressed, and then uh, the drug uptake in that cell is compared to the baseline. So, at the same time, the specific inhibitor we will see if it's lower than 50% uh, decrease in terms of the inhibition. So if these two are satisfied, then that is for sure that the, this drug is the substrate. An inhibitor again. So I talked about the substrate and now the inhibitor. The drug can serve as an inhibitor. So as you can see here, PGP, BCRP, efflux transporter, and the transporters that I just mentioned, whether uh, there are inhibition or not, need to be assessed. Well, I talked about the substrate, the drug as a substrate. It means the drug is an object, meaning that the drug is uh, affected. But what is more important is that the drug under development uh, is uh, serving as an inhibitor, meaning that affecting others. So how much inhibition and how strong that inhibition are the important questions. So KI value uh, can be measured or calculated. The cutoff value here is already established. PCP, VGRP, if it's an oral administration, then here this formula need to be used. And if it's a lower than 10, then for the transporter, the inhibition level is not that high. And therefore, there is no poss low possibility for DDI. But if it's over 10, that would be an issue. OATP 1B1, 1B3, you can see uh, the in the hepatocyte or the kidney, 
are the organs where these are expressed. And compared to the concentration uh, multiplied by the safety factor, which was 10, and the mate 1 and 2, it's 15 out of 10. And the concept is the same, but OAT1 or B1, here, this is the uh, liver. So the CMAX is the concentration in blood. But when it comes to liver, there are two ways for the drug coming in. Oral, total vein, systemic circulation. So these are two route of the drug coming into liver. So there should be the inlet considered for the CMAX. So you can see the difference, uh, that difference in the calculation formula. So we, you need to look at this guideline very well so that whether the transporters can uh, affect or not. The same concept here. PCP or the PCP, PBRC, orally administered the drug. I talked about it, but here, if it's not the orally administered the drug, then the 50 fold formula need to be applied. Why? PGP is not just about like intestine, here, brain, urine. So because of that, not just absorption, but also the distribution or the elimination process for that 50 safety factor need to be used. For the transporter inducer, there are not many uh, inducers developed, so it just says many different things need to be considered. But uh, CAR, CYP, UGT, the induction was mentioned. Uh, so here PGP uh, can be induced, that is reported, but still there are many things that need to be considered. So. If there are not sufficient data or evidence so far, the guideline says that many different things need to be considered and many different data need to be generated like that. So actually, uh, once we accumulate more data, there will be more clear guidance. I don't have enough time. So DDI potential for metabolite. So if there are more metabolite, then we have to do the study because the metabolite can serve as the inhibitor or the substrate or, substrate or the in, uh, inducer for others. So parent drug, the condition for the parent uh, drug need to be also applied here for the metabolite. So I will not uh, go into the details, but there are things that we do need to consider. Formation and uh, elimination of the metabolite, these two need to be well dis uh, distinguished. And also, as you can see here, there is an AUC in molar unit. So metabolite, when we try to understand the correlation, nanogram per milliliter, is used many times, but if one metabolite is changed, and there will be one another metabolite. So in terms of the mole concentration, it's okay, but if the unit is a nanogram from ml, then that would be a different story. So that should be you should be careful. So metabolite substrate inhibitor inducer. So the same stories. 자 이제는 크게 세 번째. And let's move on uh, to a clinical evaluation. And there are two things here. Uh, well, I mean, there's not much for me to explain here because you just need to follow what's written down here. So when you are coming up with the synopsis, so you just have to make sure uh, what's here is incorporated. And from a sports uh, point of view, they just need to satisfy the conditions of the uh, regulators, but they also need to be able to have strategies that will ensure approval. And so uh, I think that it would be quite important for you to read all the what are included in the slides. And I'm going to so I'm going to talk about the types of clinical uh, DDI studies, and then I'm going to talk about study planning and consideration for clinical uh, DDI studies. Well, a study. 
or it has to have a very clear uh, specific goal. So you have to clarify that you're going to do a DDI study. And, and there has to be a prospective studies. So you need to have a, a, a prospective studies that are specifically designed to evaluate a potential for DDIs. And a retrospective evaluation of drug concentrations should be uh, restrained in as in, and so that uh, needed for the regulatory uh, decisions and also uh, predictive modeling approaches allowed and they would uh, it, it will allow for a wave of the uh, DDI studies and this is all the uh, described in section 7.5 the CYP uh, related, uh, there's a basic model that I explained, and there was uh, a P, a P, uh, BPK model. So it's the same in chapter. And the mechanical uh, statistic model, uh, the, there are ways to calculate the AUCR. So uh, one does uh, reversible induction. Uh, excuse me, reversible inhibition as well as induction. I mean, the statutes involve just one enzyme and, and multiple enzymes. So all of this have to be looked at as part of the PBPK model. So it's not just uh, the, uh, I mean, the, the calculation itself will require one hour to for me to explain. But I just wanted to tell you there are these concepts that uh, you can apply. So this is for the static model. And here I have included a, a a model that is the a PBPK model, physically based a pharmacokinetic model, and, and the PBPK model would be a calculating uh, our uh, overall everything that's in our body in a kinetic mod, uh, body. So there, it would be possible to look at the concentration in different organs, as well as uh, the uh, what would happen when different uh, metabolites are needed and what sort of inhibition should be there to see the concentration of the drug. And that is calculated in a mathematic way. This is a very difficult uh, field, and a lot of data is required to uh, to do the calculation for the PPPK model. So it is uh, has a very it's useful but it's not easy you do and so maybe you could and so we can do uh, the interpretation according to these uh, models explained in section 7.5 and on the uh, standalone uh, DDI study is a clinical study with the primary objective of determining the presence or the absence of a clinical DDI and the magnitude of the DDI. And there's a nested uh, DDI study which evaluates DDIs as part of the larger studies in patients for which DDI ev uh, evaluation is not the primary objective. And here uh, the design has to be done very properly uh, in order to be able to do uh, the analysis. And then uh, there's something called uh, index uh, precipitants and index uh, substrates. Well, index are very strong uh, inducers or inhibitors. So whether they are, uh, you know, uh, transporters or the substrates. And if it's a substrate that's going to be given to another drug, there's going to be index uh, substrate. You have to utilize them in order to do a, to do a DDI uh, studies. And this is all explained in section seven. So I have a full list here. Uh, that is section 7.7.1. And this uh, uh, provides a list of index drugs as substrates, inhibitors, or uh, inducers of CYPs. Uh, when you're doing clinical trials, you have to pay attention to the comments here. And so when you do the designing of the study, you have to make things very uh, clear. If not, you will not be able to data that you want. So I ask you to pay attention to the comments here. And about the metabolic pathway, there is UGT. And so uh, for different types of the UGT, there are uh, different in, you know, inducers, inhibitors, and the substrates, or you have to uh, pay attention to them as well as the comments here. And so about the transporters, there are uh, inhibitors for such uh, transporters, and those inhibitors uh, overlap with the CYP uh, in, uh, enzymes. And the, uh, here you see the substrates. And so you could make use of this. So you do as described here, but if the if you have a substrate or uh, inhibitor with a clear of uh, purpose or the objectives, you could use them. But most of them uh, should be uh, index uh, substrates or inhibitors.
And then here we have the cocktail approach. And uh, cocktail study includes a simultaneous administration of substrates, uh, multiple enzymes, and uh, transporters uh, to study study. And there's something called the biomarker of approach. Uh, this is the evaluation of the, the uh, in the evaluation of the DI risk assessment is the deployment of endogenous uh, biomarkers that are substrates for drug metabolism and transport. And so, so the, some, if the endogenous biomarker is about uh, 1.25, uh, then you could do utilize uh, this method. And I'm not going to be uh, covering them in detail. This is uh, just a checkpoint when you're designing on studies about in you know, a study population, the number of subjects, how to set the doses, uh, whether there's going to be single or multiple doses. And the concepts are the same. And you have to uh, make it sure that you can get the highest level. And so the multiple uh, doses are usually the basis of the criteria. And I'm going to just be covering the important uh, elements here. Where well, crossover study has to be done in principle. So rather than parallel study, uh, well, the crossover study is uh, recommended because there's less uh, variation. And uh, there's so much information that I have included in the presentation material. I wanted to include so much information for you. So, but if you at your leisure, please uh, read them one by one. And uh, the, the, the simply the titles I have included information in the slide for you to use afterwards. So that is about the the cocktails. And now uh, move on to the other topics. And so, uh, related to clinical studies, I mean, you just need to uh, see what the checkpoints there are. And related to other topics, I'm going to talk about the pharmacogenetics and the therapeutic protein uh, DDIs. And about the pharmacogenetics. Uh, there are genetic variations in drug metabolizing enzymes or transporters that can impact a drug of pharmacokinetics, which can cause a, a variability in drug exposure or affecting uh, the safety and efficacy and altering the magnitude of drug drug uh, inter, uh, interaction. And uh, there is also enzyme uh, polymorphism, which are means uh, variants in enzymes may uh, lead to different uh, metabolizer uh, phenotypes. And so this is quite an important uh, concept. And so when you do the DDI studies, you do have to pay special attention to this enzyme uh, polymorphism. And there's something called a therapeutic protein uh, DDIs. And the PK uh, risk is uh, relatively low uh, when it comes to a therapeutic protein uh, DDIs. So this is not something that requires a lot of uh, thought or concern, but for the smaller molecules and the proteins uh, would have, uh, as you say, uh, some interactions. And there's also uh, emerging uh, uh, metal, uh, modalities such as oligonucleotides and smart interfering RNAs and modified uh, ribose nucleic acids and peptides. And so those are uh, some of the of uh, the modalities that are out of, I guess, uh, interest. So that's uh, something that's excluded. And then there is the uh, prolif pro-inflammatory cytokine related mechanism. And the CID enzymes could actually be down regulated or upregulated because of this mechanism. And so this is why such a mechanism uh, uh, deserve, deserves uh, attention. And so cytokine related uh, of the substances, and when they are uh, given together with the CYP, well, you do have to think about uh, the, uh, the sort of, of, of these issues here. And then about uh, uh, the uh, the DD, uh, there are some of the consideration for the DDI studies that are uh, listed here, and for the and these are the AUC uh, parameters that you need to uh, consider to publish the data. And so this is uh, what I want to emphasize. 
This is about the interpreting the DDI study result. If the AOC is a more than increases uh, about 1.25, so like if there's a twofold increase from 1.25, then it's a weak uh, inhibitor. So the DDI is weak. So there is interaction, but uh, it is weak. And but it is a five-fold increase, then it's a strong inhibition. Same with uh, the inducer. It's uh, less than 0 0.8, but if it's below 0 0.8, but that is so more than uh, the numbers of uh, here that is then there would be a strong uh, inducer and about the risk assessment in case of ddi because oh, there could be impact on the toxicity therefore it's important that uh, we define clear risks related to uh the uh the uh, DDI management, and it talks about uh, strategies. It talks about the exposure response relationship for the safety efficacy, the variability of the observed DDI data, and so forth. And then uh, number seven deals with the appendix. And the ones in red are the ones that I have explained. And what's on page 54 and 57, I have talked to you about it, and they are related to in vitro studies and the clinical uh, studies. And lastly, there are references.